God is going to use his children in a way that he desires them to be used. We learned that this morning. God is going to place us. We learned from the passage that Paul the Apostle showed us in 1 Corinthians. God is going to place us in the body exactly where he wants us to be. Okay, so as we go into tonight and we think about what we're going to talk about tonight, think about this. You are here right now, here at this place, because God put you here. Now, what are you going to do with it? That's the key. He's given us the gifts. He's given us his word. And he's given us his son. And he only asks one thing in return. One thing. He wants it all. He wants our love. He wants our life. He wants our hopes, our dreams, our admirations. He wants it all. Given back to him. That's the hard part. But the night on which Jesus was born was just an ordinary night. An innkeeper turns away another couple because he's out of rooms. Shepherds are out in the field watching their flocks. Ordinary shepherds, ordinary sheep, ordinary night. And if it wasn't for a God who loves to use the ordinary to display his glory, this night would have remained ordinary. Turn in your New Testaments with me to Luke the seventh, the second chapter. Luke the second chapter. And beginning in verse 8, the scriptures reveal to us, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. Now, the angel of the Lord and the glory of the Lord shone around them. This was not the middle of town, folks. This was out in the field. There was no street lamps. There was no, there was no house lamps. There was no light pollution, as we call it these days. They were out in the middle of nowhere. And then there's an angel. And we have a God that loves to use the ordinary, a dark, pitch black night, to display his extraordinary power. The glory that shone around this angel. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest! And on peace, on earth peace to men, on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And this, my friends, would be a night that these shepherds would not soon forget. These were simple men guarding the sheep of night. And the power and the glory seen through the ordinary. Powerful tools are the simplest. The light that shone around the angels would have been brilliant, almost blinding at night for these shepherds. But they got the point. Let's go and look at a couple of passages in the Old Testament. Turn, if you would, with me to Exodus, the fourth chapter. Previously, God had been speaking to Moses from the burning bush.
beginning in verse 1. Beginning in verse 1 we read, Moses answered, What if they do not believe or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Now we've got to go back in the story to remember ourselves what's going on here. The Lord had met Moses at the burning bush. A holy and sacred time. And we remember the story where Moses, as he came up, he saw the burning bush and was not being consumed. He heard the Lord speak. And the Lord said, take off your shoes, for the ground on which you're standing is holy ground. The Lord went on to tell Moses that he was going to expect of him to do great things. He was going to go to Egypt. He was going to talk to the Pharaoh. He was going to get his people let go. And Moses comes back now and answers, what if they do not believe me? Or say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? He said, a staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it down on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And he ran from it. Moses like me. I hate snakes. Anything about them. We were out cooking dinner this afternoon. And there was lizards on the patio. That's like a second cousin to a snake. I don't want any of them. So I sympathize with Moses. He ran from the snake. But what Moses is seeing here is a lesson on what God can do with the ordinary. It's, you know, you think about this staff that was in his hand. Later on in verse 20 in the same chapter, it's referred to as the rod of God. And this is going to be a reminder of the children of Israel for years of the power and majesty of God. This same rod that is used to turn into a snake. And I gotta think, I gotta tell you, Moses has got this rod in his hand. He's going to see Pharaoh. He's got proof. I know God. I've seen him throw a boom. You know, did you ever wonder? Moses is walking home from that meeting with God that day. You think he threw it down on the ground again? Just to see if it was going to happen? But then it's a desperate sight. That faith that Moses has here. God says, pick it up from the tail. Moses reached down and he grabbed it from the tail. And it turned into a staff again. And this, I believe, when the Israelites see the power and majesty that is on this piece of wood, the same piece of wood that's going to be turned into a snake and is going to swallow up the magician's rods in Pharaoh's court. The same rod, the same staff that is going to be used to turn a, a, water of river, a river of water into a river of blood. The same staff that is going to be waved through the air to bring about the frogs. It's going to bring about the lights. It's going to bring about the locust. It's going to bring about the hail, the darkness. It's the same rod that is going to be used in the parting of the Red Sea. It's the same rod that is going to be used for the destruction of the Egyptian army. This ordinary shepherd's rod was ordinary no more. Later, the rod is probably going to be a reminder, both to Moses and in, in the children, in dealing with the children of Israel. And if God can use a powerful tool, if God can turn a piece of wood into a powerful tool, what could he do with a group of stiff-necked people? What could he do with us? Let's look at another example. Um, turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. We're going to be begin reading about verse 26. But David here famous story of David versus Goliath. One of my favorite in the Old Testament. David is now sent to bring food to the battle to his older brothers. He hears the plight of the Israelite army. And David speaks boldly. Well, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defile the armies of the living God? <coughs> David's older brothers. What are you doing here? David being the youngest in the family 
probably was used to that. Being ridiculed by his own brothers. And you can almost hear Eliab in his, in, his, in his condemnation of David being there. What are you doing here? You've just come down here to see the battle. David simply replies, what have I done now? But David's confidence and David's speech gets him before Saul. And that's where we pick up reading in chapter, 20, uh, chapter 17, beginning in verse 32, read with me. Then David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of the Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go up against the Philistine to fight them. You are only a boy, and he has been fighting from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. <clears throat> when a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, and I struck it, and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned to me, I seized it by its hair, and I struck it, and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said, Go, and the Lord be with you. Wow! That's confidence. David speaks boldly before, the, before Saul, the king of all Israel. David's confidence and ability is based on his confidence in the Lord's ability. The Lord who gave me this. The Lord who gave me this. His confidence in the abilities that God had given him was his strength. And later on, we see passages throughout the, 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 throughout the Psalms that King David wrote. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Over and over again, he talks about the power and majesty that comes by loving the Lord. David's confidence and ability was based on his confidence in the Lord's ability. He didn't believe Goliath could kill him because he had the Lord on his side. Look at verse 38. Then Saul dressed David. Yeah, I got to tell you, go and be with you. Go and God be with you is what Saul said there. Now, we don't have the, the, the privilege here of having, having the, the explanations in the proper places of exactly how Saul said that. That's a pretty motivating speech, would you not say? You think David got Saul so excited that Saul said, Go, and God be with you. But knowing later on in Saul's life, we kind of got to look at the situation and think, maybe it wasn't quite that way. Maybe Saul said, go, Lord be with you. But in verse 38, we continue, then Saul dressed him in his own tunic, and he put armor on him, and a bronze helmet on his head, and David fastened a sword over the tunic, and he tried walking around him, but he, he could not use them. He says, David says, I can't use these. He said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, he chose five smooth stones from the stream. And he put them in his pouch, in his shepherd's bag. And with a sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Saul tries to prepare David for battle. In the way that he thought David should be prepared for battle. Any good soldier is going to put on the weaponry, right? Any good soldier is going to go out and put on the helmet. Put on the, we hear it in, in, the, in the book of Ephesians. We hear the power of the, the armor of God as we, as, we, as we get ourselves ready for battle. But not here. David says, I've not tested these things. I'm not used to these things. But David uses faith in God, not the armor of Saul. The story continues beginning in verse 41. It says, meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. And he looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome. And he despised him. And he said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? The Philistine cursed David by his God. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. 
David said to the Philistine, you got to get this. We got to get this. David, a young boy, no armor, a bag, some sticks, and a sling, is standing before Goliath. And he says, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defiled. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give your carcass to the, the, the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. And as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran towards the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He swung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling of stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. That's confidence in the abilities that God's given him. But once again, we see something powerful. We see that David uses an inanimate object. Moses uses the staff. David uses the stone. Saul and Goliath learn a powerful lesson on what God can do with the ordinary. A stone and a shepherd boy. I want to look at one more example this afternoon. And this would be something, I know, we might not think of the Lord using. Turn with me to the New Testament, to the, to the book of John. John, the ninth chapter. John the ninth chapter, beginning verse 1, it says, And they went along their way, and he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Mm -hmm. The disciples, in their wisdom, asked, Who sinned? Possibly thinking that maybe it was something that their parents, his parents had done. Possibly thinking a common philosophy of the day was reincarnation is that this man had somehow sinned in a former life. But Jesus states neither that his parents sinned or that he sinned, but that you could see what God could do. Jesus says, read on with me in verse 3. It says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as this day we must do, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no more work can be done. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. The disciples knew what was coming. The disciples had seen it before. They'd been traveling with Jesus long enough. Jesus was going to heal this man. All they had to wait for was what was going to happen. How would Jesus heal? Would there be a bolt of lightning come from the sky? Would it be some spectacular event that they had never seen before? Well, we don't have long to wait because Jesus is going to tell us right here. <clears throat> Look at verse 6. Having said this, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with saliva. And he put it on the man's eyes. He said, go. And he told him and wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. <coughs> the same God that used the rod and the stone uses spit and dirt. The ordinary becomes divine. The common displays His power. I want to read something to you from the book of Mark. Mark the 7th chapter. <coughs> beginning in verse 31. The scriptures tell us then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre, went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. And there were some people brought to him, a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hand on the man. 
And after he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers in the man's ear, and then he spit, and he touched the man's tongue. And he looked up to heaven, and with a deep sigh, he says, Be open! And at that, the man's ears were opened, and his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. One chapter over in, in chapter 8, beginning in verse 22, the scriptures read, Then he came to Bethsaida, and some of the people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him to the outside of the village. And when he spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus said, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hand in the man's eyes. Then he opened his, then his eyes were opened, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go to the village. We don't think of Jesus using spit. But be honest, my friends. Do we think of God using us? And this is the main point, if you don't get anything else tonight. If God can use a rod, if God can use a stone, if God can use spit to do his work, he can also use us. We just have to be willing. We just have to be available. Not the doubting or the questioning of Moses. We need to experience the surprise of Saul when he saw David bring down Goliath. We need to experience the surprise of the shock on the apostle's face as he spit in the ground and the man's eyes were opened. God can use anything he wants to show his glory. He wants one thing. He wants to use us. He wants us to show His glory. Well, let's look at some lessons we can learn from the stone and the rod and the spit. And this will answer the question, I believe, are we allowing God to use us as tools to fight His battle? First thing, the rod, the stone, and the spit, they were available. They didn't have to check their schedules. They didn't have to check their calendars or look at their watch and say, yeah, well, then let's do lunch next Tuesday. They didn't say any of that. There was no extracurricular activities to get in the way. They didn't have to, to, to say, oh, I don't have enough time for that right now. We need to be there when he needs us. When I'm not available, someone else has to do the work. Imagine, friends, if God had every tool in his bag, sharpened and primed and ready to go, what a powerful army he could create. Second thing we notice, the rod, the stone, the spit, they were willing to be used. Willing to be used for what God wanted them to be used for. Imagine these inanimate objects with human personalities. I can't do that. I, I'm not ready. I, I'm not the right person. You so, so and so. I'm, I'm too busy. Just can't do it. Can't put another thing on my plate. I'm just a rod. I just want to hang around. I'm just a stone. I want to lay here and let the cool water just kind of run over the top of me. I'm just spit. I'm disgusting. God doesn't want to use me. They were willing to be used as God wanted to use them. No excuses. They had a purpose. No complaints. Why can't I do that? Why can't I be the song leader? Why can't I be the preacher? Why can't I? Why can't I? Why can't I? No! I got to do my job. I got to do my job. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 talks about we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. All things have been made new. 
In Romans the sixth chapter, it talks about that beautiful passage of rising to walk in newness of life. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And he said, be loosed. And the great clothes fell off. We've been loosed, my friends. The sin is gone. We've been freed to do the will of God in how He wants us to do it. I think that that's a problem. I think we see Christians, from the time they come up out of the watery grave, they keep their grave clothes on. And they walk around and they're stiff. I can't do this. I oh, can't, can't do this. But Jesus said, be loosed. The grave clothes are gone. We don't have to be tied down by the sin that entangles us anymore. We don't have to be tied down with our wants or desires or wishes. We just have to serve. We just have to be there. We have to be willing. We have to be available. They didn't suggest an alternate plan. They didn't tell God how to do His job. They just did their job. Theologians, the rich, the wise, the successful, why would they use these things? Look at the example of Naaman. Katie, when she was younger, she <laughs> one of the teachers in the Bible class taught the book of Nahum, or taught, taught the story of Nahum. And Katie, for years, would say, Mom, Dad, remember Naaman? And we would remember Nahum. And then a couple minutes later, Mom, remember Naaman? And we'd remember Naaman. Do you remember Naaman? It's a great story. Naaman went down in the water and he said, but what if I... No, not what if. But I thought, no, just do what you're told. Go to the Jordan River and wash. But aren't the rivers of Farpar and Damascus, aren't they so much more cleaner? Aren't they so much better? No. They may be cleaner, but that's not what he was told to do. And when Naaman went down and he washed in the Jordan River and he came up, could you imagine that? He went down the first time. He comes up. He went down. Over and over and over and over again. And even the sixth time, wow, someone's playing a trick on me. This is stupid, sitting here washing in this dirty river. And he went down that seventh time and he came up and it was gone. It was not like there was a remnant left. It was gone. We need to let God use us for His glory. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 27, he says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And these things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in His presence. And if God can turn a shepherd's staff into a mighty scepter, if He can take a stone and turn it into a bullet to kill a Goliath, and He can take spit and heal the blind, then my God can use me, and my God can use you to heal a world that is blinded by sin. Amen? We need to let Him use us. We need to be available. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 says, But you are a chosen generation. you got to get this. The Israelites were the chosen ones, right? Here Peter's talking to us. We're the Gentiles. We've been drafted in. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Praise God. Titus 2 and verse 14 said, He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself. Catch this. Here's this phrase again. Purify for Himself His own special people. And what are these special people prepared for? Zealous for good works. Are you zealous for good works? 
Are you excited about the work of the kingdom? Are you ready to be used? This lesson is not about sticks and stones and spit, but about what God can do with you and me if we truly let Him mold us, let Him change us, and be available for Him. Max Lucado is one of my favorite authors. And he just has a way of spinning a tale. If you've read any of his stuff, you know what I'm talking about. He has a way of just putting things in a way that is so simple to understand. Even for me. In one of his very early writings, he wrote a poem called Tools in the Master's Workshop. Or Tools in the Blacksmith's Workshop. Indulge me for a moment while I read the poem to you. He said, in the blacksmith, in the shop of the blacksmith, there are three types of tools. There are tools in the junk pile, outdated, broken, dull, and rusty. They sit in the cobweb corner, useless to their master, oblivious to their call. There are tools on the anvil, melted down, molten hot, moldable, changeable. They lie on the anvil being shaped by their master, accepting their calling. There are tools of usefulness, sharpened, primed, defined, and mobile. They lay ready in the blacksmith's tool shop. Some people's lives lie useless. Lives broken, talents rusting, fires quenched, dreams dashed. They are tossed in the scrap heap of iron, in desperate need of repair, with no notion of purpose. Others lie on the anvil. Hearts open, hungry to change, wounds healing, visions clearing. They welcome the painful blows of the master's hammer, longing to rebuild, be rebuilt, begging to be called. Others lie in the master's hand, well-tuned, non-compromising, polished, productive. They respond to the master's forearm, demanding nothing, surrendering all. The question I have for you tonight, friends, where are you? We all lie somewhere in that shop. Some are in the scrap pile. Some are on the anvil. And some are in the master's hand. The rod, the stone, the spit. If God can use these things, how much more can he use you and I? We need to be willing to let him use us. Because i got to tell you what, friends. You are exactly the tool the master wants to use. He picked you out of his chest and he says, I've got a job for you. He wants to use you. And we can all be tools in his shop. Now, I want you to just imagine for a second. We're girded with the word of God. We're sharpened. We're primed. We're ready to be used. God is for us. What does the scripture say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Jesus was anything but an ordinary carpenter. He was God in the flesh. You want to know what God did for you? He took two pieces of wood and three metal spikes and hung on them the hope of all mankind. His greatest masterpiece in using the ordinary to display His glory. The symbol of Jesus on the cross is a reminder for centuries past and centuries to come. <coughs> a simple reminder of a cross. <coughs> that the Creator became the creation and gave Himself for His creation. In Acts, the second chapter, the great passage of what is the very first gospel sermon. Gospel being good news. Jesus Christ died 
on the cross, was buried in the tomb, rose on the third day, and now we can live with Him. The Gospel, the good news. Verse 32, we read, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted, at the, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. And He has poured out on what you now see in here. For David did not ascend to heaven. Yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Would you become a tool of God? Would you become a tool of God today? Would you pray with me now? Our God and our loving Father, hallowed be your name on all the earth. As we come to the close of this lesson, Father, we praise you, we glorify you, and we ask as we go from this place that we would be strengthened and emboldened to be used in your service. Father, may we have willing hearts that we may lay our lives down for you as Jesus laid down his life for us and continues to stand at your right hand. May he entreat for us every day and may we look through him to you every day as we focus upon you and walk through this life. Father, this day is the date of our calling to come home to you. We pray earnestly, Father, that we would be watchful and that we would be ready. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. The Apostle Peter tells us, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares upon him, he cares for you. Be diligent. Be sober. Because the adversary of the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings you experience by the brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle to you. To him be the glory and the dominion and the power forever and ever. Amen. Some of us need to suffer on the anvil so that we can be made into what he wants us to be. The song of invitation tonight, let him have his way with you. Would you live for Jesus? and be always pure and good? Would you walk with Him within the narrow road? Would you have Him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let Him have His way with thee. Would you have Him make you free and follow at His call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have Him save you so that you need never fall? Let Him have His way with thee. Would you in His kingdom find a place of constant Rest. Would you prove him true each providential test? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. If you're here tonight and you're not being used as the tool that you know you need to be, we can pray for you. If it's something in private, your elders want to pray with you. If it's something that you just need to deal with yourself, then we beg you. To pray. To ask God to do these things for you. As we sing this prayer, think of those words. Let him have his way with thee. Let's all stand as we sing this song.